Hi everyone, my name is Jessie Nixon and this talk is in collaboration with Fabian Tomasek. The talk is called Learning from the Acoustic Signal, Error-Driven Learning of Low-Level Acoustics Discriminates Vowel and Consonant Pairs. The COGSI theme this year, learning in humans, animals and machines, seemed very apt for this talk as it touches on all three of these to some extent. How do infants learn the sounds of their language? When we're born, we can discriminate the sounds of all the world's languages, but gradually as experience with the native language grows, perception becomes honed to the native language and discrimination of non-native sounds is reduced. For example, in the head turn paradigm, infants hear a series of sounds and are trained to turn their head only if the sound changes. At six to eight months of age, English learning and Japanese learning infants do equally well at discriminating English R and L in this task. But by 10 to 12 months, the English learning infants are better at the task than the Japanese learning infants. Probably the most popular model for explaining this process of honing perception to the native language is distributional learning. If we look at speech production data, the distribution of acoustic cues is not uniform. Instead, clusters form around particular values. On the left, we see an idealized distribution for voice onset time Q in English B and P. There's a cluster of relatively short voice onset times for B and a cluster of relatively long voice onset times for P. On the right is the distribution for Māori. In Māori, there's no voicing distinction, so there's only one sound here and therefore only one cluster. According to distributional learning, if there are two clusters, we form representations of two sounds. If there's only one cluster, we form representation of only one sound. This is a very intuitively appealing model and I think it's contributed a lot to our understanding of speech sound acquisition, particularly in that it provided a means by which sounds could be learned from the input rather than being innate. However, there are also some issues with distributional learning. Several recent studies have shown that distributional learning on its own can't account for speech sound acquisition and many studies have failed to find distributional learning effects. To give just one example, on closer inspection, it turns out that not all sounds actually cluster into two separate clusters as shown here on the left. Often, even if there are two or more sounds, the distribution looks more like the one on the right, only one cluster. In addition, recent work in second language acquisition shows that second language speech sound acquisition is a predictive process, is error driven and involves cue competition. These aspects are not accounted for in distributional learning. I'm going to come back to this in a moment, but in the present study, we're proposing that first language speech sound acquisition is also a predictive error-driven process that involves cue competition. To illustrate what I mean by error-driven and cue competition, there's a very well-known study in animal learning research. This is Kamen's famous blocking study with rats. Kamen trained rats with two cues, a light and a tone, followed by an electric shock. Not very nice for the rats, of course, but after repeated training with the two cues, they tested the rats with just one cue, for example, just the tone. The rats showed a fear response to the tone. Then a separate group of rats received an additional pre-training before the training phase, where they were presented with Repeated trials are just one of the cues, so just the light followed by the electric shock. Then they had the same two cue training as the other group, and they had the same test as the other group, so just the tone. In this case, they weren't afraid of the tone. Both groups of rats received equal training with the light and tone. The only difference was that this group had pre-training with just the light. That meant that the rats could already predict the shock based on the light and the tone added no additional predictive value. So it was ignored, or in other words, learning of the tone was blocked. This is known as Kamen's blocking effect. This experiment demonstrates that learning is not simply about association or co-occurrence. It's a predictive process. Cues compete for predicting relevant outcomes and learning is driven by uncertainty. When there was not enough uncertainty left to drive learning of the tone, it wasn't learned. Kamen's blocking effect, as well as decades of research in animal learning, led to the development of the Ruskola-Wagner learning equations. 
The, the equations estimate the trial by trial updates to the connection strengths between cues and outcomes. In other words, how expected a particular outcome is given the available cues. No change occurs for any cues that are not present in the current trial or learning event. For all cues present in the current trial or learning event, connection strength increases to outcomes that occur and decreases to outcomes that don't occur. Importantly, the amount of change depends on prior learning. If an outcome is highly expected and occurs, it's not very surprising, so there's not much learning. But if an outcome is highly expected and doesn't occur, or was not expected and does occur, this is surprising, and so more learning occurs. Recent work shows that the Rascola Wagner learning equations also predict human learning. For example, in a study just published this year, we showed that blocking occurs in second language speech sound acquisition. In this study, participants had to learn speech cues for the diminutive versus the large objects. There were two cues, nasal and tone. If participants were tra trained with the two cues simultaneously, they learned the cues. However, just like Kamen's experiment with rats, if the participants received pre-training with just one of the cues, say just the tone, before the two cue training, they didn't learn the second cue and often selected the wrong object, so the large object instead of the small object. Learning this first cue had blocked learning of the second cue. This blocking effect could help explain why learning a second language is more difficult than the first language. It also demonstrates that second language speech acquisition is predictive, error-driven, and involves cue competition. So in the present study, we wanted to create a model of early speech sound acquisition that accounts for infant behavior in perception studies such as the head turn paradigm accounts for the error-driven nature of learning found in previous work and is based on the acoustic signal, that is, it avoids imposing any a priori linguistic units. Basically, the idea is that infants use the incoming acoustic signal to predict upcoming acoustic signal. We trained the model using the Rascola Wagner learning equations. The model was trained on a moving window across each speaker in a corpus of spontaneous speech. Because we wanted to model the prediction of upcoming acoustic signal from the incoming acoustic signal, both cues and outcomes were spectral amplitude components representing the acoustic signal. The spectral frequencies shown vertically in the figure were divided into 104 equal mal steps at around half a mal each. Time was divided into 25 millisecond windows with 15 millisecond overlap and the log power spectrum value was measured for each of these components as a measure of amplitude. The figure shows one learning event. The outcomes are in blue and the cues are in red. So the outcomes are all spectral components in one time window and the cues are the spectral components in the two previous and one following window. And this continues over the whole sound file. At the end of training, we have a matrix of connection weights between all the cues and outcomes that have occurred during training. This weight matrix represents the level of expectation of the different possible outcomes if a particular cue is encountered. We then tested the model using tasks that are common in human perception studies. We produced sound pairs separately and created a continuum between them in Prat. This shows a continuum between B and P with B on the left and it gets gradually more P-like across the continuum. On the y-axis is the probability of selecting B. When people hear a continuum like this, we don't usually see a linear slope like this, but instead we see a high probability of selecting B at this end of the continuum and a lot of B respons P responses at this end of the continuum and a steep slope in between. At least this is typical of stops and uh, consonants. It works a bit differently for vowels, as we'll see in a moment. 
test, stimul our test simulates infant decisions to turn their head or not in the head turn paradigm. Recall that infants are trained to turn their head only when the sound is different, so this measures whether they perceive the sound as different or not. We used a 20-step continuum between each sound pair, for example V to F, and the two endpoints of the continuum represent the sounds that are used as the different stimuli in these infant experiments. So our questions are to what extent each endpoint stimulus is activated by the steps along the continuum, and in which spectral frequencies do these effects occur. And here are the results. We analyzed the results using GAM models of activation as a function of continuum step and spectral frequency. We'll look at the consonants first. So here's the results for the V to F continuum. On the left is the model estimate for the probability of selecting or hearing V. We see that it starts high on the left at the V end of the continuum um, and then there's a slope and then it uh, flattens out towards the F end of the continuum. This is the typical shape for consonant perception that we've just seen. On the right we see the topographical GAM plots of activation for the different spectral frequencies. On the x-axis is the continuum step again, on the y-axis is the spectral frequency, and activation is on the z-axis and is color-coded. Warm colors like yellow are high activation, blue is low activation, and green is in between. This center plot is the results for the V target. And v is on the left of the continuum. So what we see is that as we move from left to right, activation gets lower as we get further away from the target and closer to the competitor on the continuum. This occurs in the lower frequencies where the voicing cue is for the VF contrast. On the right we see the inverse for the F target. Now on the next slide we have the results for the sh, sh pair. We see the same basic shape on the left in the categorization plot, the sigmoid shape, and on the right we see that the effects occur in different spectral frequencies. Here the change across the continuum occurs in these higher frequencies uh, associated with a different center of gravity for these different fricatives. And again we see a similar basic pattern for s, sh, and for s, sh. Now, when we look at the vowels, there's an interesting difference. These are the results for e, u. Now the plot on the left looks much more linear. This is actually typical for vowel perception to be more linear than consonant perception. We should point out here that we didn't actually predict in advance that our model would capture differences in perception between consonants and vowels, but we find it interesting that it does predict this difference. And finally, the results for e, e. So I'd like to just briefly mention some of the limitations of the model. It currently only includes acoustic information and doesn't include sight, touch or other modalities, which we believe are also very important. The input is currently adult current conversational speech, not infant directed speech, which could be incorporated in the future. The model has restricted temporal scope, so for example, prefixes in a word can't see the suffixes and so on. Uh, it's also currently trained on only half an hour of speech per, per speaker, although the model does perform quite well with just this small amount of training. So in summary, after training the model is able to discriminate consonants and vowels and simulate infant dis decisions in perception experiments. It learns from general learning mechanisms, namely error-driven learning. It doesn't require any a priori linguistic units and is able to learn from the acoustic signal itself. It also finds the most discriminative cues in the expected spectral ranges for each sound pair.
So we suggest that error-driven discriminative learning of the acoustic signal may be a feasible alternative to distributional learning as a model of early infant speech acquisition. Thanks for listening.